We continue to preview the 2024 college football season. Our stop today is Pikeville, Kentucky, as we visit with Corey Phipps, who's the head football coach for the Pikeville Bears, heading into his fourth season as the head coach. And, Coach, we look ahead. The season's not that far away now as we're midway through the month of August. I know your first game is, well, just about two weeks from now. But let's start. Let's go back in time just a bit in the Waymac machine and talk a little bit about 23 to get to where we are. Your first season in the Appalachian Conference uh, after being in the Mid-South every year prior to this past year, 7-3, and 5-1 and one in conference play. It really came down to the, the game against Reinhardt, and that was back and forth all the way through that game, including a double overtime six-point loss there to uh, to Reinhardt. Tell us a little bit about last season. Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, it was an awesome season. Great experience for our kids and our university and our athletic department to, to transition to the Appalachian Athletic Conference. You know, we, we sit right here as, I think, the, uh, you know, premier academic institution of higher education in central Appalachia. So uh, we had a lot of good ties to the mid South, but we just felt like uh, it was a better fit for all of our sports, specifically, uh, you know, the, the conference tournaments for, for all of our sports were about an hour and a half away and thought our fan base could really support those other sports. Now football, we don't have a conference tournament, but we just felt like there was some like-minded institutions there that we could fit with. And so we hopped in there and uh, had a really good season, you know, thought it was uh a uh, tremendous deal to, to get in there and compete. And, you know, Reinhardt has been the, the class of that league. Um, you know, they've been the class of uh, this region and in, in the Southeast and NAI football. And I think a lot of James Miller is one of my best friends and the athletic director there, Jeffrey Corshear is one of my good, good friends as well. And so to, to lose it there, play some double overtime, you know, James walked across the, the field and said, man, I hate somebody had to lose that one. It was <laughs> I said the same. I said, I, I wish this thing could have gone all night, you know, and it, it was it was a lot of fun. And and, uh, you know, we recruit a lot of kids from Georgia. You know, we're, we're still, you know, five, six hours from that, that greater Atlanta area. So we got a great fan base there. And, you know, to have them to come come to us this year would be big. But, you know, you just look at, you know, who our kids were last year. We really established our culture. It was two back to back winning seasons for the first time um, since like 05, 06 here at, at U-Pike. And, you know, there, there was a lot of cool things that happened on the field, but, you know, we had a 3.2 team GPA and, you know, 5,000 hours of community service. And, and our guys really bought into the unique culture of, of Central Appalachia here in Eastern Kentucky. You know, this is this is a, a different a different place. And, you know, I think our institution uh, really could, you know, you could really be your own state here in Eastern Kentucky compared to the rest of the state. And, you know, really, U Pike would be the flagship institution, uh, you know, and, and Pikeville would be the state capital. And so this is coal country, the coal fields and, and the, you know, the mountain kids here to come to play for us, to go off to Division One schools and come home to help us build this thing. They understand there's a purpose to the University of Pikeville that's, that's a little different than some of your truck stop towns where some of these NAI and D3 and D2 schools are located. So, you know, I, I just think even above and beyond that seven and three record, you know, we would have loved to have a conference championship ring. We would have loved to have uh, made the playoffs for, for only the second time in school history, but it doesn't take away from the fact that, you know, we feel like we're building strong people for strong times here, you know, or strong people for tough times, you know, good dads, good husbands, the opportunity to, to serve their community. Um, we are a bit of a pre-med institution. We've got a med school and optometry school and starting a dental program. So, we get a little bit higher academic kid here who's a little bit more purpose driven than a lot of places. And I think that shows up on the field when, when you're accountable to each other in a brotherhood. Coach, I'm, I'm going to take some of those analogies and, and, and give you credit for it for the most part, but I think those are awesome analogies to use in talking about your, your athletic department and the university as a whole too, all of it positive. And that's really what we appreciate here on Midwest Sportsnet. So thank you for that. By the way, speaking of last year, best winning percentage, uh, I believe in in school history with that seven and three record, and I love the way it was written about in the recap, looking back to last year, that the team completely abused the record book. So that's that's another quote that stuck with me in, in thinking about that. So fantastic year, and I know we get a chance to look ahead to this year. Before we do that, um, between last year and the upcoming season, you took on some more responsibility as well. Now the athletic director. Yeah, so Kelly Wells was our athletic director here. And in my prior stop at Kentucky Christian University, I was the head football coach. Um, I was the athletic director. I was the vice president of enrollment. I was the night janitor. I was my own GA. 
Um, <laughs> and, you know, we had a COVID spring season. We went six and two, which was one of the better years they'd ever had there. And, and I get this phone call from Kelly and he says, hey, man, come have dinner with me. And I said, ah, I got a job. I don't need dinner. <laughs> and he said, he said, just come check it out. And I came down here and fell in love with a town and a community and uh, just the culture that I thought we could really never duplicate. Uh, anywhere else I'd ever been at this level in terms of just the infrastructure of academic support, um, the the return on your investment to go off into the workplace and, and really make a difference with with that degree. So uh, I, I drove an hour and a half home trying to figure out how I t- was telling my wife we were moving for uh, the ninth <laughs> time in our marriage. And it, it wasn't it wasn't easy, but I convinced her, convinced my three daughters. And we we came down the road and had the opportunity to. Uh, to kind of get things rolling. So Kelly goes on to be the athletic director at Moorhead State where uh, he played basketball. His dad was the women's basketball coach. Mom was administrative assistant for for the president a long, long time. He was going home. And we were without the athletic director uh, for almost a year. Our softball coach was the interim AD, did a great job. But then we we kind of figured out some things. We, uh, you know, had some gentlemen come in and, and – uh, a couple of them said, Hey, you know, I can't take the job at this point, but you know, I think you need to, I think you need to look at coach Phipps. I think Corey would do a great job. And our president, our provost and some folks kind of circled around town and people talked about how we had made a real dent in the football culture here. And I was out in California recruiting some junior college kids. That's where I played and where I grew up. And I still like to go get a few of those West coast guys. And all of a sudden I started getting calls from president of the bank and I started getting calls from uh, the, some guys at the fire station and the police station and this guy and that guy. And I thought, well, they're digging a little deeper on me. And uh, so I came back, interviewed for the athletic director position and stepped into that role. I've got some great uh, folks around me in terms of our administrative team. Um, you know, our, our softball coach has stayed on as, as an associate AD or assistant AD, Robert Staggs. He's been here a long time. I joke that he remembers when the Dead Sea was just sick. Uh, so he, he knows where all the dead bodies are buried. helps guide me quite a bit. Bradley Yoder's a assistant athletic director for us. Our senior women's leader, Lauren Curley, who's our head athletic trainer. And then the 26 uh, sports we have in the athletic department here to represent about 650 student athletes. Those, those coaches, uh, are, are my co-pilots in this deal. And I just get to be the lead coach and help to, to dictate a culture that I think is going to take us in and, you know, a little bit of a new direction. Uh, our old direction went bad, but, you know, the world has changed in athletics with, you know, this transfer driven transfer portal NIL fictitious world out there that our small college kids see and want to emulate. And we still want to be at the core a place that, that values education and the experiences that make people uh, successful beyond uh, the University of Pikeville. So, you know, I get to travel all over the state and the southeast and the region and through the mountains here. And, and I cannot find a community where there is not a mover and shaker or a difference maker that doesn't have a degree from the University of Pikeville. And that's that's pretty uh, humbling. And uh, it's it's you know something I, I take uh, very seriously and, and know that um, I've got to be a good steward of the, the brand and the name of this university. And, you know, it's it's uh, hard sometimes not to get emotional thinking about it when you when you get a chance to lead 650 student athletes. Absolutely. Coach, I, I appreciate every bit of that. Thoroughly enjoy talking about the positives of the programs and listening to the, you know, the great thing about making a difference with culture and beyond. And so let's talk about then 2024 and 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 transition there because some of the players we're going to talk about, I mean, we're, you're looking at a lot of grad students, which means the culture is there. They want to come back. They want to give at least one more year to the program on the offensive side of the ball, led by Lee Kirkland, who's coming back for one more season. And what a great year he had last year. Uh, 31 touchdown passes thrown. He didn't throw one of the first three games. So that's the last seven games in which he threw 31 touchdown passes and had one of six, and the finale had seven in that one. We talked about him quite a bit on Midwest Sportsnet. Tell us a little bit about your offense. I know it starts there. Yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of an old Hal Mummy, Mike Leach, Air Raid guy. You know, I worked for Hal Mummy at Bellhaven University in Jackson, Mississippi, and uh, had a chance to, to work at a few places. But I've always been a throw-it-around guy. As, a, as an old offensive tackle, that, that kind of sounds funny. But, uh, you know, Lee – dynamite human being, you know, and, and last year we started the season where he split time with uh, Xavier Malone, who was the second team all conference quarterback the year before when Lee got hurt. 
And so I felt like naturally we had to let things play out and, and they did. And, you know, quite honestly, Lee threw 31 touchdown passes and only played in three complete games. Yeah. So he, he's a big feller. He's about six, six. He'll tell you two fifty. I won't, he doesn't like it when I tell people what he really weighs, but you know, <laughs> uh, there's not a better human being, you know, he, he leads with class. He, he directs, uh, directs traffic to practice. He's a, uh, leader on this campus, which many of our guys will talk about are today. Um, but he's, he's come back to get his MBA, uh, master's in business administration, have an opportunity to, to go out in the workforce and, and do something special. His daddy's an old high school coach there in, in uh, South Carolina, just outside Hilton Head and left in South Carolina. And I think he gets, uh, he gets it. And, uh, we talk about our quarterbacks really being, you know, not, not really Peyton Manning or, or Tom Brady, but, you know, I want John Stockton, you know, I want a guy that can distribute the ball and, and make sure guys are getting it. And he, he really understands that we even let him call the play from the field in the spring, just so he could get a deeper understanding. And, and that was pretty tremendous to watch. I told him he might be missing his calling in life to be a, be a college football coach. But he's like a lot of these guys, there's a lot of money to be made out there right now. And the small college guys uh, still don't make much. So, uh, but yeah, so everything kind of runs through Lee. You know, we've got some some outstanding wide receivers. Diego Soto, who's who's back with us for his last year, play slot receiver, is, is super super dynamic. We got a young tight end and uh, Grant Scott, who's who's an interesting story. I I tell the story that Grant's a local Pikeville High School product who came in and we thought, you know, I told the coaches we're not getting him. The dad was not digging the chili; like he did not like anything about the visit and. The next uh, Monday, the dad comes in and says, hey, are you in the he Texas me, text me and says, are you in the office? I said, absolutely. And he walks in with his older son, who had been a scholarship offense lineman at EKU, graduated, went on to be a high school teacher for a couple of years here at Belfry in the county. And he says, I want him to play. I said, well, does he still have eligibility? He said, yeah, as a grad student. So, uh, you know, his brother goes uh, from from teacher to, to player to just play with his brother two last year. So uh, we got Scott boys uh, that they'll do great things for us. We returned two all conference offensive tackles, um, you know, and uh, uh, Jacob Kopchak and Michael Lee, uh, both outstanding, outstanding young men who who uh, really bought into to our system last year and, you know, we got a couple guys battling out center. You know, one's a Division One transfer from uh, EKU who started in nose guard for us last year, uh, Landon Rowe. And, you know, then we've got a couple other guys on the interior that are really outstanding, really young at the running back position. Got one kind of upperclassman that's getting it done right now. And, and Tyrese Christian, uh, uh, who's been with us for a little while, Southside Chicago kid. But he, uh, you know, he's kind of run, helping us stable of young running backs get up and going. Got a couple of transfer wide receivers on the outside and a guy named uh, uh, Trey Stafford, who's who's been with us, who understands the system. So offensively, I would say probably, you know, guys that have been in the system uh, two, three years, you know, I would say 11 of 11 are, are those guys. So uh, we feel like those guys really understand our kind of uh, our pace and our, our system. So I think offensively, we we feel comfortable now. I don't know if we can duplicate the success we had last year. I think we might end up being a little bit more efficient in what we do, but you know, you never know in what we do. You can, you can really sling it around the yard on a Saturday. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, Kirkland 61 plus percent completion percentage too, you know, on top of that, I, I mentioned also, I don't, I think I neglected to say AAC offensive player of the year, but yeah, I mean that, that, that shows a lot of what you can do and, and uh, be efficient in that we're visiting now with, Corey Phipps, who is the head football coach for the U-Pike Bears here on Midwest Sports Net. And I encourage you, please take the time, subscribe to the channel. We will always appreciate that. I'm not sure what it does for the algorithm. I'm really not, but it does help us. So we, we would love it if you'd subscribe. Coach, defensive side of the ball, you've got some more of those gentlemen that have been there for a while. On the defense, defensive line, Ben Tate, Myson Livingston come back. Tell us a little bit about the defense. Yeah, if you look at our defensive line, you know, we're a three, four structure. And uh, so our two defensive ends return, Myson Livingston, um, who's, who's, you know, been around the program, Georgia product. And then uh, you got Ben Tate at the other defensive end, uh, Burns High School there in Spartanburg, South Carolina, one of the premier programs in the country, both back in their master's degree. Um, really a little bit undersized, but can can really bend and, and really rush the passer. 
you know, we got a newcomer at nose guard right now. It's really helping us. Uh, Shiloh Sanders. You might remember his uncle junior stay out. <laughs> so, sorry, not shy, shy. Sorry. Shiloh uh, say out. I guess we're just all used to saying Shiloh Sanders. Uh, <laughs> Shiloh say out. You might remember his uncle Jun, uh, junior say out with the San Diego chargers. So, yes, sir. Um, Great, great player out of uh, Palomar Junior College. Those three guys are going to really head up our front. We've got uh, a couple guys backing those guys up that, that could be starters at a lot of places. Um, you know, inside backer right now, uh, Chuck Moore was all conference for us, undersized guy. You get every uh, pound for pound uh, worth out of his, his value as an inside backer. Um, picked up a University of Cincinnati transfer. And outside backer right now, Trevor Carter from Ironton, Ohio, that we think is going to be an outstanding player. And then you look at uh, the secondary, got a few young corners uh, on one side, and we've got a returner on the other. And then safety, you know, we've got uh, Brett Coleman, who's a local product, who transferred to us from Miami, Ohio, who will be in his third year as a starter and can can really run. And uh, uh, Job, Jobby Shepard, that one corner is the returner. And uh, we, we feel like that, that secondary is pretty stout. Now, not a lot of young bodies in there that are providing depth. But, you know, I, I think that 3-4 structure, if you look at it offensively and defensively, we were really the, the best offense and defense in the, in the history of the program in, in the same year. And that's, that, that's pretty impressive as well last year. Hopefully we can duplicate that. I don't think you can go wrong having depth, especially on the defensive side of the ball. I know that's a, that's a big deal when, you, when you're playing a structure like that. Coach on special teams, Jacob Headley comes back, kicker last year, uh, 67% field goal kickers, did well for you, throwing in some extra points as well. Tell us a little bit about the special teams. Yeah, Jake Jake does an outstanding job. I've been the kicker here for a long time. I recruited him at my previous stop, and, and so to get a chance to you know, uh, coach him since I've been here, uh, you know, he, he's a guy that not only on the field is great, but, you know, I like I like to tell a story. We do a thing called Fist Bump Fridays and, you know, where we go, uh, we go help the uh, the faculty and staff at local elementary schools get the kids out of the cars and we fist bump them and high five. We got music going and it's great. And the mascots there a lot of times. And uh, so it's a good deal. Well, the first time we do it, there's a, a mom that pulls up with a, with a young child on the spectrum and. Uh, she says, uh, son, I, I'm going to go on up to the principal. The principal's the only one that can help my child out of the car. And he says, man, if you, if you would just let me try, my sister has some similar things and, uh, man, their, their hands connected. It was like an electrical charge and Jake's been connected to that family ever since. And, you know, just to watch things like that out of Jake, you know, he, he was our lead guy in terms of community service and, you know, uh, he, he's just He's just the guy you're proud of constantly. So, you know, and, and I could tell you stories like that more than touchdown passes all day about our guys that I'm, I'm more fired up about. But, you know, I think, you know, punter wise, we, we only punted 20 times last year. So we quick kicked a little bit with our quarterback, but, you know, no risk it, no biscuit, that old, uh, that old saying. So um, every, every down's a down, I can throw it. So, you know, even on fourth down, we, we might keep our guys on the field. Coach, and I, I do remember seeing that there were there were games where I mean not more than one punt and some without them at all. So that's uh, that's yeah. an interesting take, but it, yeah, it's just like you said. I mean, you know, you get the opportunity at, at every point in time. This season, right at two weeks away. As a matter of fact, you're looking at a Thursday night game. Fifteen days from when we're recording this Thursday night, you get it at home. You take on uh, and and again, Mid South scheduling alliance there. Same ten teams you saw last year. Uh, you get Campbellsville at home. You get Georgetown at home. Uh, I'm sure that's a bit of a luxury right there. And then you go on the road to take on Cumberland's, Faulkner, then a bye week before the AAC schedule starts. And this year, you get Reinhardt at home. So uh, that that's going to be right up there in, in your neck of the woods on October 5th. So I usually don't go halfway through the schedule, Coach, but uh, I wanted to get that last game in there as well, too. Tell us a little bit about the opening to your season. Yeah, it's, it's really a, a tough opening. I think Campbellsville is going to be much improved. I think uh, Jake Russell, their head coach, did an outstanding job in his first year there last year, and they've recruited some really good players. So, you know, that's a game that we won 28-27 last year on a quarterback sneak to really end the game. So we're, uh, we're looking, you know, we're looking to hopefully uh, not have to take as much blood pressure medicine in that one. But we will uh, take on them at home in a, in a night game on a Thursday night. So, excited about that 
Um, then we turn around and get uh, three o'clock the next week on a Saturday. Uh, we get Georgetown College here, which is a big rivalry in this state, obviously, and they've been the class of the Mid South for a long time. And you know, Chris Oliver's a national championship winning coach. Spent some time at Lindsey Wilson College, starting that program. Um, I think it's in our benefit that they go all the way to Montana Tech, where I actually worked for a little while. Um, and uh, then they got to come back, come back and play us. So uh, I'm not, I'm not wishing for jet lag, but it, it wouldn't hurt my feelings. <laughs> and then uh, we turn around, like you said, we go to Williamsburg. It's uh, University of Cumberland's and Shan Housekeeper, the head coach there, is a good friend. And I think. They do things the right way there. And, and that was a tough loss for us last year. We thought we should have had that one. We had it the year before at their place. So hopefully we can bring back that that trend, beating them at home. And then you get to go all the way to Faulkner University in Montgomery, Alabama, where I spent four years as the offense coordinator. So that's always emotional to go home and see a bunch of people I love and eat a bunch of good Southern food while we're down there. And then and then we'll be ready for that bye week to get ready for uh, James Miller and, and the Reinhardt uh, football program. So um, you know, that's that's a tough first five weeks. Our guys got to be ready for the gauntlet. Um, after that, you know, I don't, you know, people can say it gets easier, but I don't believe so. You know, I think Bluefield's a, a strong opponent. I think Union was much improved. Kentucky Christian and St. Andrews are going to be much improved. Uh, we've got to go to Point in Georgia, which is always a tough trip there. Uh, it's one of those bizarre towns that sits on the, the change <laughs> of the time zone. So I can't ever figure out if it's central time or eastern time. So post-game meal may show up an hour early or hour late, but, you know, I think, uh, I think the schedule really works out well for us in terms of some good home games and night game opportunities to, to get recruits on campus. And, you know, it's just exciting to continue to watch these guys develop as young men and our community wrap themselves around us. You know, you, you see, uh, since I've been here, you know, we've had, uh, you know, back to back to back, uh, you know, I guess record gates and attendance. So it shows that our community is, is really wrapped around who we are and what we're trying to do with these young men. We are, some are from here and, and some are from scattered from all over the place, all the way from America, Samoa to, to Pikeville, Kentucky. Well, coach, I've learned a lot and I really appreciate the time. And I'm, I'm not officially going to say I'm going to steal some of the things you said, but I may allude to that. Right absolutely. now, I, I absolutely love it, and I would appreciate it if you would come back on the channel anytime. You're always welcome to come back. Coach Corey Phipps, Pikeville Bears, getting ready for the 2024 season again just a couple of weeks away. On a Thursday night, it will be at home in Pikeville, so folks, come on out and watch the Bears play. Coach, thank you so much for taking some time with us today here on Midwest Sportsnet to preview the 24 season. Thanks, Joey. Appreciate you.